So, Luke, Luke chapter 9. Luke is a doctor. He's a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. He writes this book while Paul is in prison. And while he's writing this book about Jesus, he uses older documents such as the Gospel of Mark as well as extensive eyewitness accounts. Jesus' ministry is well underway, and the people are amazed not just at what he says, but also at the things that he does. So, verse 46 of chapter 9. Then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be the greatest. As to which of them would be the greatest. Now, I was thinking about this. Who is in on this discussion? Who is in the discussion among the disciples about who would be greatest? Now, I can, I can give you some suggestions. I think probably at the top of the list are Peter, James, and John, because after all, they are part of that inner three. And I think Peter could make a claim that he's the greatest because he's the guy, when Jesus said, who men say that I am, Peter spoke on, up and said, you are the Christ of God. You are the son of the living God. And, and Jesus even gave him some kudos and said, well, God just spoke through you. So I think Peter can make a claim of, to this being the greatest thing. James and John, not to be outdone, they sent their mom to help them out. And, it, and uh, they got help from mommy, and it says in Matthew 20, verse 21, and he said to, his, to their mom, well, what do you wish? And she said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left, in your kingdom. Now, remember, this is a Jewish mother. Oy vey, you do what the Jewish mother tells you to do. I mean, I mean, you don't get much more serious than that, having the Jewish mother, you know, uh, you know pushing, twisting Jesus' arm. And when the other ten disciples hear what James and John's mother had done, they're all quite upset. And in Matthew 20, it says, verse 24, and when the ten heard of it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. So there's, there's this stuff going on about who's the top dog, verse 47. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child and set him by him. He perceived the thoughts of their hearts. He didn't have to hear any arguments. He knows what they're thinking. He, can, he knows. He can tell. And he takes a little child and set him by him. Jesus is going to answer the question about greatness using an object lesson of a little child. In verse 48, and he said to them, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all will be great. Now, whoever, when he says whoever will, receives this little child, I think the point here is that you can tell a lot about a person by how they treat the children in the room. Um, you can tell who's really great by how they treat children. Some people feel that children are nothing but trouble. And I got to tell you, it is my opinion that those people are not very close to Jesus. I, I remember I told the story first service, so I might as well tell it again. I, I remember years ago at, at Calvary Anaheim when I was when I was the assistant pastor there. Um, I don't know if you guys remember we had just we had just moved into the new building, and just got the carpet down and just got the the pews the brand new pews in. And the pews were just gorgeous. They were just, they were, you know, it was just awesome. It was so beautiful. We were so proud of them. And like the week after the pews went in, a band of little children after church come running through the, uh, come running through the sanctuary, getting up on the pews, jumping up and down on them, jumping from pew to pew. I heard from, from one of them this, after first service that they were playing something about hot lava or something and not, not, not to get your feet burned by touching the ground. And they were jumping all over the pews. And because um, my son was like the ringleader, <laughs> the guy who's running the college group right now. He, he was the ringleader of, of this whole batch. Daniel doesn't remember this at all because he was just following along. He was probably like two or three at the time. And, um, but David was jumping. And, 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 and I remember one of the older, I don't, I don't know if you remember this, Dave, I, I, but w one of the older couples in the church came up to me. And they were very upset. 
because we had just spent, we spent $45,000 on those new pews. $45,000. I mean, it was a chunk of change. And they were upset. And they came up to me and they said, we, we can't believe that you're letting this go on. What, would you treat, you, what, do, you, do your kids treat your furniture like this at home? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry to say, sad to report. You know, they do. <laughs> and, uh, but I got to tell you, you got the wrong priorities. When you're more worried about the pews than you are the children. Jesus was concerned about children. Um, he says, he goes on to say, whoever receives me receives him who sent me. And, and so Jesus is saying that if I want to know God, I need to know the one that God sent. That there's only one way you're going to find God, and that's going through Jesus. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then he says in verse 48, he who is least among you all will be great. He who is least among you. And I want to talk for a few minutes about the path to greatness. Um, some people have this mistaken notion that the path to greatness is connected to who you hang out with. And if you want to be great, you better start hanging out with the people that are cool, the people that are great. You know, it's all about who you know, they'll say. And, uh, and, and sometimes I'll, I'll get people like that in the church, you know, because they'll want to hang out with me because they think I'm like great or something, and, and, which I am. I am. I just want to let you know that. Um, I'm available for lunch. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 I'm not. I'm going to be sleep. I'm going to be sleeping when you're eating lunch. Um, and people want to hang around with the great ones. But I got to tell you, Jesus' followers should be hanging around with people that others ignore. And yes, it might be children. Um, it might be the handicapped. It might be the homeless. It might be a person who's brand new to church and they've come here all by themselves and they don't know anyone else. And I got to tell you, this is, a tough, this is a tough room. It's a tough, especially when you come by yourself. I am, some of you are incredible, I'm not going to stare at you, but some of you, I know it's like incredibly brave of you to come to church on your own. It is. I, I am so proud of you. Every day is so wonderful suddenly it's hard to breathe now and then i get insecure from all the pain i'm so ashamed would it be okay if i sat here i am beautiful no matter Is she what serious say, whatever new girl Words can't bring me down. So don't you bring Reaching me down out. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Sometimes all it takes is just to say hi. <laughs> I like that. Mark records that Jesus called them to himself and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them? Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. 
For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You don't become great in God's sight by stepping on people. You become great in God's sight by serving others. Um, Jesus came to serve and to give his life for us. F.B. Meyer, he was, um, he was a preacher down the street from Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon had the big church in town, 10,000 people every Sunday, packed to the, to the gill, standing room only, and F.B. Meyer's church, not so much. And there was times where he struggled with jealousy about this. And he writes this. He says, I used to think that God's gifts were on shelves stacked one higher than the next, and the higher you got, the more gifts you got. Then I found out that they were really on shelves one lower than the next, and the lower you became, the more you received. Um, I remember when Deb and I uh, first left the Baptist church to, in our journey towards full-time ministry, I had been a youth pastor for six years at the Baptist Church, and we are, the first place we landed to get involved with Calvary Chapel was Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and we were there for six months. And I remember coming up to Pastor Chuck and thinking, you know, I've graduated from Talbot Seminary. I have a master's degree. I've been in ministry for six years, and I want you to know that you ought to be grateful that I'm coming to your church. You know, I, I didn't exactly say that, but I, I felt that. And Chuck said to me, like he said to many people, he said, well, why don't you go teach a Sunday school class? And I had to tell you, I did not want to hear that. Because I've been teaching Sunday school for six years. I'm ready for bigger stuff. I'm ready for adults. In fact, I got a certificate. It's hanging on my office wall now. I got a certificate that shows you that I can teach Sunday school teachers how to teach. So you don't need me to teach Sunday school. You need me to run this church for you. You know, I'm, I don't know what I'm really thinking there. But I, I just, I couldn't do it. I just wouldn't do it. We eventually left Costa Mesa because we, we didn't know how to fit into a big church. We ended up at Calvary Chapel, Coast, at Calvary Chapel Anaheim. And, and I learned to serve. And I, uh, I, 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 learned, I learned to serve at Calvary Anaheim. And after a couple of years, Pastor Mark brought me on staff. And you know what my first job responsibility was? And when I, my first full-time staff position was? Children's ministry. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. God, that, that's God's path to greatness, is learning to serve. And I got to tell you, um, there are a couple of openings in children's ministry. Did you hear that? I'm hoping that they'll get filled by some of you looking to be great. No, looking to serve. Verse 49. Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. Now, now, this interesting thing, it, the verse starts with, now John answered. And you know, when somebody answers something, it means they're answering something. There's a question. There's something that they're replying to. There's something that they're following up on. And I just kind of used to blow over that word. Well, you, you mean John just spoke up for, and he just changed the subject. Maybe this is another day. No, this is not another day. He's, he's responding to something that Jesus said. So what's he answering? The great Greek scholar A.T. Robertson says this. I love this. He says, it's as if John wanted to change the subject after the embarrassment of the rebuke for their dispute among, uh, uh, concerning greatness. It's just, they're just all red in the face. That he, that they, he caught them arguing over being great. And so he says, well, well let's ch change the subject here. You know, you're going to see through this whole thing this morning, these were three different little vignettes about the disciples. And they're all about how imperfect they are. About what a bunch of jerks they are. I don't think I'd want these guys as friends. At least not the way they started out with Jesus. And you know what? Same with us. Same with us. We call this process sanctification. It's the process where God is slowly molding us, shaping us to be more and more like Jesus. We all have rough edges. 
I imagine there may be one or two of you this morning that will we'll kind of chip at some of those rough edges this morning at some of the things the disciples struggled with. This is a part of maturing, folks. These guys didn't come to Jesus. He didn't call perfect people. He called jerks. And then he started to whittle them off, whittle around them, and help them become more like him. Now it says, John, so John says, we forbade him because he, there's this other guy casting out demons in your name. And how dare he? he we didn't give him copyright permission and, and licensing authority to do this. You know, so we forbade him. You better stop it, buddy, or you better pay your dues or start coming to church with us. You know, we forbade him. Um, when you are insecure about your path to becoming great, follow me. When you are insecure about your path to becoming great, you're not going to be happy with the competition. You're going to want to do whatever you can to destroy the competition. You see the other guy as somehow a threat to your pursuit of world domination. Where are you going, babe? Back to the cage to plan for tomorrow night. Why? What are we going to do tomorrow night? The same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. <laughs> Sorry. We used to watch that when my kids were little. I just love that. Look, John is acting like someone who's quite insecure about his world domination, not someone who wants to see God's work done on the earth. And so what does he do? We've got to shut this down, Jesus. We've got to shut this down. You know. Jesus said to him, Do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. You see, we're all on the same team. We're all on the same team. Sometimes people that should be on the same team are fighting with each other. There's a man and a woman. They've been married for many years. But whenever there's a confrontation, yelling could be heard deep into the night. The old man would shout, When I die, I will dig my way up out of the grave and come back and haunt you for the rest of your life. The neighbors feared him. The old man liked the fact that everybody feared him. And then one evening, he died. He was 98 years old. After the burial, his neighbors, they were concerned about about her safety. And they said, well, aren't you afraid that he might indeed be able to dig his way out of the grave and haunt you for the rest of your life? And the wife said, ha, let him dig. I had him buried upside down. And I, and I know that he won't ask for, inst for directions. <laughs> it is sad when people who should be on the same team are fighting against each other. I think that sometimes churches do themselves more harm than good when they fight with other churches. We can get so nitpicky about the differences between us that I think the unbelievers don't have a clue about this Jesus that we follow. Jesus said, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, I think, this is just my pet philosophy. I, I, I may be wrong. We'll find out. But I, I believe that God allows various denominations in order to accommodate the variety of people who believe in Jesus. I think some people need the quiet psalm organs and the rituals and the robes and stuff like that. I think some people need that. I think that that's how they're wired. I think other people are a little bit more emotional. And I think some of us are somewhere in the middle of that, you know. And you know what? It's okay if people don't worship the way that we do. It's actually okay. Now, I think you have to be careful about how far you take it because there is such a thing as counterfeit. Um, not everybody is really on the same team. There is such a thing as a church preaching another Jesus. There are false apostles, Paul talks about. In Galatians 1, he talks about if anyone preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. There are non-Christian cults like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, and I'm sorry, I don't, don't mean to offend you by this, but the Jesus that they teach about is not the same Jesus that's in your Bible. Um, they, they believe in an inferior person, a created being. 
They believe that you have to earn your way to salvation instead of Jesus dying in your place. But within the Christian church, I think that there's a huge variety of styles and flavors. So when you're talking to your friends and you find out that they go to church and you say, what church do you go to? And they say, we go to First Press up there, on, up on Euclid. You go, oh, what a jerk. You're just such an idiot. No, no. Encourage them in their church. Encourage them in their church. You know, they go to the Baptist church. Awesome. Very cool. Go to the Episcopal church. I'm going to make some of you uncomfortable. Go to the Episcopal church. They go to the, they go to the Methodist church. Don't go there with all the things that are wrong with that. Encourage them in Jesus because they are a part of the same team. You know what? I got news for you. We're not the only church in Fullerton. In fact, well, we are the best church, right? <laughs> right? Do I hear an amen? <laughs> no, actually, to tell you the truth, I know some of you are, are church shopping. We always have a number of people in the church that are going around trying things out, and that's okay. And let me encourage you, there are a lot of good churches in Fullerton. Fullerton is blessed with a lot of good churches. I shouldn't be telling you this, should I? <laughs> Look, we're all part of the body of Christ. We're all on the same team. And things go easier when a team learns to work together. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> years ago, Pastor Chuck telling a story when he was much younger and he used to belong to something, something like a Rotary Club. And they had this invite your enemy banquet kind of a thing, you know, where you invite your competition to the club to help, you know, get, bring more members in and stuff like this. And somebody asked Pastor Chuck which pastor he was going to invite. And Chuck responded, I'm not in competition with other churches. I'm going to invite the bartender at the bar down the street. See, that's understanding who the competition is. It's helpful when you understand who the actual enemy is, Satan. And you learn to work together with those on your team. Okay, come on, everyone. I'm scheduled. You know what's got to be done. Move it, move it, move it. Hey, you there, pick up the pace. You're falling behind. Oh, Working with the team. You know, you're going to find that there are Christians who are jerks, um, who have questionable motives, and you don't like being with them. But look what Paul says. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice, and I will continue to rejoice. We're on the same team, guys. We need to, we need to, we need to figure that out. Verse 51. 
Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now we've mentioned over the last couple of weeks that Jesus is on his last journey to Jerusalem where he's going to fulfill his prophetic mission where he will be betrayed, where he will be crucified, and where he will rise again, where he will pay for the sins of the world. And verse 52, and he sent messengers before his face, and as they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. They sent messengers. These messengers are, they're the advance men, uh, setting up the arrangements for the whole team, making the hotel reservations, setting up the banquets and all that kind of stuff. Because it's not just Jesus and 12 guys. There could be somewhere up to 50 people traveling in this group by this time. Next, in the next chapter, Jesus will send out 70 people. So there's, there's, a, there's a number of people traveling with Jesus. And they entered into a village of the Samaritans. The Samaritan race came about when the Assyrians caused foreigners to intermarry with the few remaining Israelites after they had wiped out this northern kingdom in 722 B.C. They're a mixed race. And the Samaritans rewrote the Mosaic law. They changed the names and the places so that Abraham offered Isaac on Mount Gerizim instead of Mount Moriah, and the feasts were all to be celebrated in Shechem instead of Jerusalem. Now, some of us are going to Israel in a, in, in a week and a day. Um, we'll be here now, I'll be here next week, but a week from Monday is when we leave. And we'll be, I, hopefully, we're going to be in Shechem. So I'll take pictures. I'll, I'll show you pictures of Shechem. Today, there's about 800 Samaritans left. They're a very close, tight-knit community. Verse 53, and they did not receive him. The Samaritans did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. Now, uh, when the Samaritans find out that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem instead of Shechem, they just close all the doors up. They ignore him. The Samaritans and the Jews, they, they hate each other. They hate each other. It's mutual. In the next chapter, in Luke 10, Jesus will tell a story about loving your neighbor. And we know the story as the good Samaritan, the hero of the story, the one guy who cared for the guy who got beat up by the, the thieves. The one guy who cared was not a priest or a Levite. It was a horrible, wicked Samaritan. And keep in mind when we get there in a couple, couple weeks, that Jesus tells the story after he's been rejected by the Samaritan. Jesus is very different than us, isn't he? Doesn't seem to hold grudges like I do. Verse 54, and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, when they found out that, that there wasn't, all, all, all of the motels said no vacancy, and they could tell they're not, they're not, they're not full. When they saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them like Elijah did? Now, commanding fire from heaven, that speaks of asking God to send lightning to destroy something. That's just in case you ever wonder what that is. It's, it's like, okay, God, get them, and yeah, you know, God's going to strike you with lightning. It's that kind of a thing. Um, I think that this incident is why Jesus had come up with this nickname, because this is their personality. This is, he, this is why he came up with a nickname for um, James and John. In Mark 3.17, he calls them Boanerges, or the sons of thunder. Because these guys are fireballs. They're, well, I have pictures of them. Um, I... I think that when they had their day off from the fishing business, I think they were part of a biker crowd, I think. And I don't think they were part of a nice biker crowd. And, uh, and, and keep in mind, actually, James and John are kind of being spiritual here. Because remember when they were up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, Jesus got all white and glowy and shiny, you know. And remember who showed up? The two guys that showed up were, were Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. See, commanding fire from heaven was the kind of thing that Elijah did. That's what he's good for. And shoot, they just spent, they just spent some, some quality time with Elijah. I wonder if he even signed their leather jackets on the back or something. I would have had him do that, you know, or have him sign my Bible or something, you know. 
um, the first time Elijah called fire down from heaven was in 1 Kings 18, where he had this great showdown between himself and the priests of Baal. And, and God answered Elijah by sending fire and consuming the sacrifice on Mount Carmel, which we will be at in a couple of weeks. The next time that this happens in Elijah's life, because it didn't just happen once, he, the king of Israel had sent men to arrest Elijah, and he sent a troop of 50 men. And, and each time that he sent a troop of 50 men, Elijah would call down fire, and they were consumed. That's, that's probably where they get it from, you know. I find it interesting that our two bikers aren't asking Jesus to call down fire. He's probably too nice. Instead, instead they, they volunteer. We'll do it. You know, that sounds like a really cool thing. Just teach us the secret words and we'll be do it. I'll do it. I'll be, I'll be your guy. I have a little message for you, friends. Jesus doesn't need defending. He doesn't need defending. In the Middle Ages, some of the, one of the blackest times of the church where the church was sending armies to battle Muslims and kill them in the name of the Lord. It was a dark day for the church. And there's a lot of misconceptions about the, about the Crusades. I, I understand that. But there was also much wickedness that went on. Last January, a, a, radical, a group of radical Islamic terrorists killed 12 people in Paris because the Charlie Hebdo newspaper continued to print these cartoons that were offensive to Muslims. Now, they felt that Mohammed needed defending. And so they killed the staff of Charlie Hebdo in a brutal massacre. But I can tell you, that's not what Jesus would tell his disciples. Not at all. Now, I'm starting to go down some rabbit trails that might make some of you a little uncomfortable. Because how do we respond to terrorism? It's a big thing right now, isn't it? The nation's on high alert right now. The holidays, they are v the FBI is extremely worried about the holidays coming, wondering if they have enough people to track it all down. I do believe that it is legitimate for a nation to defend itself. We get this from... Romans 13, where Paul is talking about government authorities, and he says, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. In other words, you know, if you go, you know, the speed limit on Chapman, well, it's kind of confusing, because there's times where it's 30 miles an hour, then it's 35, then it's 40, and then it's 45, and so you've got to really be careful, because I've been pulled over in the 30 mile an hour zone when I was it, it, you know, it's just only like a block long, but they're waiting for you. But when you're going too fast and you see the fellow in your rearview mirror, you should be afraid of them because that's their job is to, is to deal with people who are breaking the law. Okay? That's, that's what he, their authority comes from Romans 13. He says, he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. I believe God gives the government the authority to defend our nation. I don't think that's in question. But don't confuse national defense with defending Christianity. Because Jesus doesn't need defense. He doesn't need defending. He can handle himself. There will be a day when he will make things right. And I, and I got to tell you, you don't want to be on the wrong side of that. Why doesn't he do it now? Because he's merciful. Second Peter 3, 9, he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, even terrorists. I'm getting ahead of myself. Verse, uh, verse 55, so Jesus turns and he rebukes them. And he said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. So we're supposed to be men and women who produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which looks like 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I don't see a hint of calling down fire from heaven in there. Do you? There's not a hint of calling down fire from heaven. And Jesus rebukes them and says, you don't even, you don't even know what you're talking about. You don't know what spirit you are. Verse 56, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now, when it says they went to another village, a few weeks back, Jesus was giving his disciples some um, instructions for their mission trip on what to do if they should get rejected by certain people. And he said in Luke 9, 5, and whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake the very dust from your feet as it Shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. Well, now Jesus is going to give them a little lesson of what that looks like. It doesn't mean shake off the dust and call down fire. It means shake off the dust and let it go and walk away. He says, the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And the last lesson I want to say is this. Save or destroy. It's hard because when we get criticized, when we get attacked... We want to attack back. Um, I got to tell you, God has no interest in destroying people. God has no interest. Ezekiel, this is the Old Testament. You know that God of wrath part of the Bible? Not so. But Ezekiel 33, God, verse 11, God says, Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? God has no pleasure in the death of wicked people. Jesus' main concern is that sinners be saved. That doesn't happen when you kill them. Peter writes, Finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tender-hearted, and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil, don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. I, I, I know what it's like to get angry and to get mad. Um, I've heard people praying curses on people that they're mad at. But that's not Jesus. That's not Jesus. Now, what happened to the Samaritans? You know, this isn't Jesus' only time in Samaria. In John chapter 4, a little bit earlier in time, he, he meets with this, a woman of Samaria at a well, and she comes to trust in him as the Messiah, and she ends up affecting her entire city. That's kind of cool. That's probably before this time. When the first wave of persecution would hit the early church, Philip heads to Samaria to preach. And it says, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with, a, crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. This is the beginning of a great revival in Acts 8, a great revival that would sweep through Samaria. I don't think that would have happened if Jesus had wiped out an entire town earlier by calling down fire. Now, it might be that today you haven't yet received Jesus into your heart, just like the Samaritans. Does God want to destroy you? i got to tell you, he does not. He does not want to destroy you. You may have Spent your whole time, whole life fighting God. Does God want to just smush you in the ground and destroy you? That is not. That is not God's heart towards you. God 
loved you so much, he sent his son to die for you so that he would die instead of you. It's not a God who hates you. That's a God who loves you. And I got to tell you, he can't save you if you haven't received him. If you haven't opened your heart to him. First John 1, I mean, John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Let this be the day that you say yes to him. Don't turn him away and wait for another day. This is the day. Let's stand and pray. So, Lord, I, I do want to pray. If there's any of our friends here, Lord, we are so glad that they are here. We are so, so glad that they are here. And I, and I pray, God, if they have not yet taken that first important step of receiving you, of letting you in, of letting you into their heart, I pray, Jesus, that they would, I pray that somehow your truth would make it through their heart and that they would see, God, that they need you. Friend, he died so that you could be forgiven. And when you are forgiven, you can know God. Not know about him, but to know him. You would spend eternity with him. He'll teach you how to give up all of your anger and your hate. Let today be the day. And it starts with a simple whisper in your heart to God. I wish I could pray the prayer for you, but I can't. This is something you have to pray. This is a choice you have to make. Coming to church doesn't save you. Opening your heart does. And I'm going to pray a simple little prayer. And if you pray this with me, you're on, you're on the right path then, friend. This is how it starts. You'd say to him something like this. Dear God, I think I'm beginning to understand. And I make a choice today to open my heart to you to receive you into my life. I admit that I am a sinner. And because of that, I need your forgiveness. Would you help me to turn from my sin so that I can follow you Would you make me your child? And I will choose to make you my Lord. In Jesus' name.